And that's when I realized that these three things in my life were really important to me. They happened to lots of people like me and I should use them. They were, they weren't, um, they were weapons that I could turn around and I could use to do good in the world. I grew up in Brixton in South London. I was born and raised in a small African Caribbean family. I'm of Jamaican heritage. I first came out to my head of year, Mrs. Martin, and I was really struggling with my sexuality. I was about 15 at the time and was really down and really depressed and unhappy. And I spoke to her and she was so supportive and she gave me numbers for a lesbian gay switchboard and a local gay group for me to check out. And that was just really helpful. London in 1985, when I came out for a young gay man, was incredibly different to what it's like in the 21st century. It was much smaller, it felt much darker, but there were gay spaces, mostly in Earl's Court in London, and there were a few pubs in my local area, but it really was a pub-based scene. But as a young black gay man, I was really lucky and fortunate that I found my tribe and I found other black gay men and a black gay community. So I went to lots of black gay house parties, which were really, really cool and again, really safe spaces. I got tested and diagnosed for HIV in 1986, in November 1986, and I'd been out for just over a year. I'd not long turned 17. And the HTLV3 test, which eventually became the HIV test, had just become available. My first reaction when the doctor told me was absolute shock. I remember being completely silent and just feeling like a wall descended upon me. But by seeking out support at local service centres from other positive people that I could find, that slowly, slowly started me on the journey to acceptance. But it took many, many years for me to get to a place where I accepted HIV as being a part of me. One of the worst things I ever got were night sweats, where you would wake up in the middle of the night completely drenched. And it was a constant worry that something would happen to me. So I was never hospitalized. I only got hospitalized when I started HIV medication and I reacted to them like 20, 15, 16 years later. But I didn't go for anything, but my mental health really suffered as a result. And I can't underplay that at all. Physically, I was okay, but my mental health was put through the ringer over those years. This is a time when there's really high racism in the country. So the intersection of my gayness, my blackness, and my HIV made the world feel really dark, made it feel like there were attacks on you. I think there was a moment in the mid 90s, early 90s, where I started to find other black gay men who wanted to make a difference in the world. And I felt safe in those spaces to talk about my HIV. I felt welcomed, I felt family with them. And that's when I realized that these three things in my life were really important to me. They happened to lots of people like me and I should use them. They were, they, weren't, um, they were weapons that I could turn around and I could use to do good in the world. When I wanted to tell other black gay men, it was black gay men, about safer sex, about avoiding HIV risk, it was simply because I didn't want anybody to experience the stigma, the shame and the hurt that I had felt. And it also felt important to me that by teaching people how to avoid HIV, then I might be able to start addressing some of the stigmatizing attitudes and the fear that people had. And that motivated me. It wasn't that I wanted to be an activist that was gonna change the world. I just wanted to make the world a bit safer and nicer for men that might have the same experiences as me. So I volunteered for a few groups like Let's Rap, which was a black gay men's discussion group. And then I was really fortunate to be employed um, by a couple of guys who were setting up an organization called Big Up. And that would have been in around the summer of 1995. And I'd not been working for a while, but I'd run some workshops and they approached me. And it was the first organization in the country which was set up specifically to address the sexual health and HIV needs of black gay men. And for me, that was such a brilliant opportunity to bring together my community, to work with men like me, to do work which was fun, sexy, creative, but most importantly, really, really necessary. In around 2012, my colleague and business partner and good friend, Will Nutland, who I'd worked in health promotion for many years, contacted me and was like, look, we need to relook at what's going on with gay men's sexual health in this country. It's getting a bit tired. It's getting a bit boring and it's not really meeting the needs of younger men who are coming through and we need to change that narrative. 
And around the same time, we start to see more research happen, come out about the effectiveness of PrEP. So in around 2014, we got together with a couple of other guys and around Will's kitchen table, we came up with the idea of PrEPster, which was to educate and agitate for PrEP access in England. PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's a drug that somebody can take before they have sex and it prevents HIV. It's highly effective. There've been lots of trials done and it works in men and women. It works in all people and it's there for people who think they might be at risk of HIV. So the Love Tank is a community interest company that's run by myself and Will Nutland. And we set this up not long after Prepster. And we recognised that there was a real need to have an organisation that was refuelling the community. So we work to address the needs of marginalised, vulnerable communities, so queers, people of colour, trans community, sex workers, you name it, to try to address health inequalities. And we do that through health promotion and campaigning, through advocacy, lobbying and research. Black and Gay, back in the day, came to me when I was in the shower. <laughs> on the weekend before LGBT History Month this year, 2021. And I'd seen It's a Sin, which had come out just before, and just saw that it was a bit of an absence around black queer history in this country. And I spoke to Jason Okandeya, a young man who I work really closely with, and we set up an Insta page. And the idea was to capture and celebrate black queer life in the UK from 1970 to 2000. And our aim was to have pre-digital pictures which showed the community loving, partying, socialising, protesting, because we want to make sure that that narrative is part of UK queer history, but it's also part of UK history. Traditionally, over the years, if we look at HIV prevention work, particularly in this country, we've had a, we really had to fight for black gay men's voices to be heard and to be recognised and to be featured. Hence, organisations like Big Up, like Blackout, like Let's Rap. We had to do the work because white gay organisations were not doing it and were not being inclusive. So that plays a role. But I think if you look right across all areas of healthcare, as has been highlighted this year with COVID, black communities are disproportionately affected by poor health outcomes across the board. And systemic institutionalised racism cannot be ignored as an issue. So yeah, the race definitely plays a part in why black gay men continue to be disproportionately affected by HIV. I really believe that by empowering positive people, by giving them the tools and the language to look after the condition, to understand their medication and have open, honest conversations with other people leads to visibility, which then leads to us challenging and ending HIV stigma, or certainly shifting HIV stigma. And I think my work with positive people over the years has proven that because I've seen that change happen just by allowing positive people to explore themselves. Part of the issue as we go forward is that HIV now becomes invisible because people take their meds and they don't have to tell anybody. So there's less visibility about it. So people who are diagnosed can feel even more isolated. And one of my concerns about young gay men getting diagnosed now is they may feel, well, we've got PrEP, we've got U equals U. How did I mess up? You didn't mess up. These things happen and they will continue to happen. Just look after yourself. And that's the most important message I want to give to them. Anything is possible, you know, and I'm incredibly proud of this to, to be recognised in my community for the work that I've done and what I've contributed and just being me, really. And I think that's the thing that I would want people to take away from that is that I've done all this just by being Mark, just being a regular boy from Brixton who thought, yeah, things don't have to be like this. Let's make it different. And that's what this has ended up doing.